All right, guys. Season two of the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast starts right now. I am your host, Randy Zelli. I'd like to say special thank you to our producer and the creator of the making the show look as best as we can. Andrew Fumi, thank you so very much. All right, I have contributors throughout the season of season two here. We're going to have Jamie Rush with her uh, her girl point on the show, a female perspective of professional wrestling. Match of the uh, week, match of the month by Austin Eric. He's going to be joining us as well. Other contributions from Matthew Sargent, Jonathan Mowry, and of course, uh, all other, other cast of characters. So we have a lot of stuff going on over here with the cut and backsportspage.com. The cut is, of course, this is the beginning of season two. Kid Cash is guest number one in season two. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, you know, he's he's retired now, but man, he was one of the great high flyers and he made history. So keep in mind, he is one of the first guys to do something that was really never done in, in pro wrestling uh, from where he, where he was when he was with Impact and WWE and ECW. So there's a lot of stuff going on that you're going to pick up on during the interview. Uh, I'm in my new studio. So we're, we're putting the whole studio together now. So this has been pretty cool. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Real quick, I want to tell everybody about our special contest that we're having here on the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast uh, as a reward for liking us on our social media platforms and subscribing to our YouTube channel. We are going to host a trivia night. Now, this is how the trivia contest is going to work. You are going to see questions about certain episodes of our show. So, for example, you might see a question about this interview I did with Kid Cash. You answer that question correctly on Facebook. We are going to enter you into a contest room where it's like a randomizer. And if you are picked from the randomizer, you're going to have it be available to participate in our trivia night where you can win a cameo from a professional wrestler. I'll give you five choices of a professional wrestler and you can pick that one and they will send you a cameo. Uh, for those who don't know, it's like a messaging service. So they're going to send you a message. Uh, to you, personalized, to you. Two second prize, two runner-ups are going to get a six-month subscription to Pro Wrestling Illustrated, one of the most legendary pro wrestling magazines uh, out there today. And then we also have six pro wrestling po uh, prize packs where you have a bunch of different wrestling memorabilia, merchandise uh, available through us, through the cut, from some of our guests, through WWE, th through AEW, Impact Wrestling, Ring of Honor, Mystery prize packs. It's going to be awesome. So with that being said, we have the contest going on, which will rock. Uh, I want you to keep following the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. Like you know, we always do. We always plug our social media. That's how we handle it on here. That's what we do, and we're, we're really good at it. Follow us on the, as you see on the bottom there, the bottom scroll, Cut Wrestling BSP on Twitter. Facebook, Cut Wrestling BSP, the, the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. Uh, Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel. All right. So before, yep, there's all of our social plugs again. Before we go to Kid Cash, we have a quick message from one of our contributors, Austin Eric, with the match of the month. What's going to be coming up on the next episode of the Cut? He's going to join the show and discuss what his July math of the month. Math of the month. Easy for me to say match of the month will be so austin take it away hi everyone i'm austin urch coming soon to the cut i'll be breaking down july's match of the month on july 28th at fight for the fallen the elite squad in the dark order with hangman adam page battled it out in a 10-man elimination tag match keep your eyes and ears open for that episode coming up only on the cut pro wrestling podcast All right, special interview time here on The Cut. I'm joined right now by David Cash. Fans remember him as Kid Cash. Dave, thanks for giving me some time. I really appreciate it, man. Hey, not a problem, man. It was good to talk to you. 
Well, listen, I, again, I'm a big admirer of the real workers uh, in the business and people who um, were not exactly the guy who puts the cup to, you know, hand to the ear for the cup to try and listen to the crowd or, uh, you know, doing hand gestures or anything crazy. You were a worker in the industry. And I just got, I had a, just had to ask you a couple different questions because I, I'm definitely want to, you know, give you the opportunity to tell your story. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of people may not have realized was at the age of seven, you started boxing. Is that, is, is that correct? At the age of seven, you started being sort of boxing with your dad? Yeah, uh, seven, yeah. And then I started martial arts at 10, and then I started wrestling in school at uh, about 13. What was that What was that like at that age to, to sort of get into – the combat, you know, get into combat type of sports, boxing. I, I, I feel obviously at that time, boxing was a lot different than what it was now. Well, you got to understand the era, you know. Uh, oops. Hold on one second. My dog just got up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, um, I mean, you, you had to kind of understand, you know, the era of uh, back then, you know, so. Um, Actually, what was the what was the question? Yeah, about when you were that age, getting involved with boxing. Obviously, oh, boxing. boxing was, yeah, yeah, boxing was a, it was in a different well place. Well, there, there, there's a story behind it. It's the era. My dad, uh, he was a boxer. He was a boxer in the in the in the U.S. Navy uh, after Vietnam. He uh, reenlisted and then spent the last few more years uh, just on the base boxing for the for the Navy. Um, I was about so you, so you can understand you know being in that era of the the sixties and the early seventies, you know life is different. It's not as uh, you know so agreeable <laughs> yeah. as it is nowadays. Uh, back then you you had to fight every now and then. You know there was a time you you had to go behind the barn and just throw down and get your butt whipped or, or win one or the other. You know, but uh, you learned something. You you got you. you Got your manhood to you. I, I went to school and uh, I got bullied. I, I was confused. My father always told me, don't get kicked out of school. Don't get into fights, you know, and stuff like that. Because he was a very stern man and we didn't want the punishment behind it. So I went to school one day and I was being picked on because I was a short guy. I was skinny. You know, I was kind of a runt, you know, in the class, you know, being picked on and I didn't fight back. And uh, so when my father came to pick us up, uh, you know, of course, I got in trouble. Of course, you know, the teachers took us to the office and stuff. Uh, but the principal was actually putting me over pretty good. <laughs> you know, like I, I showed such good self-control and all this other stuff. And all along, my dad's like looking at me like, what? You know, he's like, that kid put put his hands on you and you didn't do anything about it, you know? And I was like, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to want you to whip my butt, you know, get grounded and all that stuff. So he explained to me the difference, you know, of what he was trying to say. But then the very next day, he uh, he's, we had a garage and uh, he's, we started boxing. And then uh, I did that for five, six months. And then he, we joined the YMCA Wee League boxing team. And uh, so I would uh, fight at the uh, YMCA uh at once once a month and then my dad would train me through the week you know so and then uh from that uh uh we we had a neighbor that moved in beside us um his name was uh david david rollins i don't know if anybody ever heard of him, but he he was actually in the navy too but he was also into kempo and uh he was actually a black belt in kempo but he also taught uh he he was really good at aikido and uh krav maga so my him and my dad became really good friends and neighbors and stuff like that. So I would, uh, he had about 15 blue tick hounds that he liked to take hunt stuff. So I took care of the hounds and cleaned their kennels and did all this stuff. And then he taught me Krav Maga. And then, of course, from there, I in high in you know, school element, well, middle school, I started wrestling for the wrestling team. But back then the era was different. It was, it's not like it is now, you know, it's uh, everybody yeah. <laughs> back then you had to fight, you know, and uh, my dad was very disappointed in me that I didn't fight back enough to where he, he uh, made me start learning how to box. Well, that, that first off, that's 
That's amazing because you're right. There was a, definitely a different time frame back at that time, mm -hmm. but now boxing and uh, mixed martial arts it started at such a young age, and it's yeah. organized and it's organized. Um, and then later later down the line, you you eventually met Ricky Morton, and mm -hmm. Ricky and Ricky got you involved with professional wrestling. What was it like? Because Ricky was like a rock star back in the eighties, man. Like he was that guy where you know guys wanted to be him, you know, chicks wanted to be with him. It was like a younger. I don't want to keep comparing to Ric Flair, but that's what it was like for him, right? Uh, it was. Uh... He, he was, he was, he was, <laughs> he and Robert were like huge, huge stars. And what, what's funny is I, I grew up, I mean, I grew up in central Virginia. So I grew up on mid Atlantic wrestling and NWA national wrestling alliance. I, I didn't know anything about WWE or anything of that nature till like the, the real late eighties, you know, well about the mid to late eighties. Uh, so I grew up on the rock and roll express. And, uh, but also along with that, I was, you know the even back then you you know you, you you heard those the stories if it was fake or not and then on top of that i was involved with real collegiate wrestling real martial arts you know real boxing uh that kind of competition and stuff so whenever i did get into wrestling it was really cool the way i met him you know and then and then on top of that uh you know me watching him as I grew up, you know, and thought it was really cool and stuff. And then he showed me what I already kind of figured was right, you know. And, um, and then he, you know, he just, he really took me under his reign. He didn't have to do it. You know, I mean, Ricky has just such a great personality and um, we instantly hit it off. I mean, for the first time we spoke to each other, we, we just kind of like connected, you know, and uh, he, he offered it to me and I was like, I'd never been into the wrestling business at all, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he offered it to me and uh, he liked my look and he liked my athleticism and stuff like that. And he thought he could do something with me. And, and uh, he, uh, I was like, well, you know, do this or be a welder for the rest of my life, you know, cause I was a welder at the time, you know, and, uh, with, for my dad actually. And, um, uh, didn't really want to wake up at five o'clock in the morning anymore. <laughs> so he, he, uh, he took me under his wing and that's, that's where I kind of began. You, you didn't want to wake up at five o'clock in the morning anymore. Instead you were hanging out with Ricky and going to bed at five o'clock in the morning. That's a different story for a different time. Yeah. Um, um, can you also talk about, you know, your, when you were training and you were getting involved with the pro wrestling industry, what was like the first couple bumps? Like, was it like what you imagined it to be? Did you realize, all right, this is, am I like, am I over my um, head? Or <laughs> no, uh, <clears throat> The bumping wasn't a problem uh, for me as much as um, knowing how much to hold back, you know, as far as punches and kicks and stuff like that. Uh, the bumping wasn't because I, you know, I was already used to tumbling and, you know, things of that nature with the wrestling and the, and the martial arts and, and that, you know, because martial arts, you're tumbling all the time, you know. And, right. Uh, you so you are in wrestling too, collegiate wrestling. So um, the the bumps wasn't it. Was, it was just knowing not to get, you know, knowing how much not to give. You know, because I was tatering so many people <laughs> in the beginning. I was like jacking people hard, you know, and I didn't realize I was holding back, but I didn't realize that I needed to go back that much more. You know, and, and so uh, the the first little couple of years people were just didn't like working with me and you know thought i was doing bad business and stuff because i was just so damn stiff and so damn you know uh, i just nailed them with everything and i and i really was holding back uh but uh, it took me a long time to realize how to you know hold back and then make it look real too that was my problem i couldn't hold back without making it look good you know so <laughs> well yeah that's that's um, what steve austin yeah. always said you always had a you, you, you got to lay it in there. You got to make it look good. Yeah. Well, and that's the way I was actually brought in. But the, the, the era that I was brought in, uh, it was starting to change a little bit. You know, my, my first match was, was with Wahoo McDaniels. And uh, he beat the, the hell out of me, you know. And only because 
I was told to respect the veterans and to, to listen to them and, you know, don't talk back, you know, that, that old nature. And even though I had a wrestling background, a martial arts background, a boxing background, I could have defended myself a whole lot better than I did, you know? And, and it all broke down to, I didn't know Carney, uh, Ricky and didn't teach me Carney at that point. And, uh, cause it was kind of fading out about that time of wrestling people just wasn't using as near as much as they used to. So, uh, he didn't teach it to me <laughs> and Wahoo from the word go. And, and of course, Wahoo never called a spot. So when you're in the back, I mean, I was used to walking, you know, being like, you know, getting together and, and calling at least the first opening, you know, and then we could put the rest of it together in the ring, which is not a problem. But Wahoo wanted the whole entire match called in the ring. And, you know, so I, I hadn't done that yet. And then whenever I got in there, he was talking Carney to me. I had no clue of what he was saying. <laughs> I didn't know anything he was saying. And then one of the, you know, the, one of the things they teach you is never be a deer in headlights, you know? So, and that's what happened. I was like a deer in headlights. I was, he was talking to me and I was like, so finally I, I kept stumbling and, and just was hesitating so much. And you could tell he was getting mad, but he kept talking to me and Carney. And I finally just <laughs> said, huh? Like that. And when I said, huh? <laughs> his eyes got about, his eyes got about that big and his face just <laughs> dropped. And I, I just, my heart dropped too. And he walks me to the corner. And he grabs him out of the neck really hard. He's a he was a big big man. Now he played professional football. He was about six four probably, and he was a legitimate two hundred and fifty pounds easy. You know, I mean even more I would say, and very strong. Uh, but yeah, he grabbed me by my throat. <laughs> he walked me to the to the ropes, and he he said, "I was if I was you, I would blow all my air out." And again, I was like, what the fuck does that even mean? You know, and I was like, what? <laughs> he chopped me so hard, bro, that uh, it knocked the air out of me. So I dropped to my knees and I'm like just gasping for air, you know, trying to get that air. If you've ever had the, the breath knocked out of you, you know how scary it can feel. And uh, plus you're trying to get, grab that air and get it back into you. But whenever I was grabbing for air, I, I just seen his moccasins walking around me <laughs> in a circle. And he got back around to my side and he kicked me in my my liver so hard. It, it literally flipped me back over onto my back. Uh, that's how hard he kicked me. So I got my air back <laughs> from the kick, but I had the deepest pain in my liver that I couldn't move. I couldn't move, period. And uh he reached down and grabbed my foot and he looked down at me and he says, welcome to the wrestling business. <laughs> and he did a, he did a, uh, um, a spinning toe hold, you know, remember yeah. the spinning toe hold. He, he stepped over, did a spinning toe hold and he, and he wrenched it and broke my ankle. Ah, yeah. And then he put his foot on my chest and then he, uh, beat me that way. So, but through that, that, that kind of woke me up to everything. That first match changed my whole attitude, my whole outlook and my whole future as, to the business. I didn't look at it as this was going to be really cool to, you know, to do and to be a superstar and all this other stuff. I immediately looked at it. This is a cutthroat business. They'll hurt you in this business. And uh, I better watch out for myself. I need to start fighting back and I need to start treating it as a business. This is about money. This is a, not about fame or fortune. It's about, you know, making all the money I can retire in and, you know, things of that, making it as a living, you know. And uh, that that's when I changed at that moment. My very first match was the one that, that changed me completely. And it's funny you say that about it being about money. That has to lead into ECW and yes. uh, working for Paul Heyman. And, you know, can, can you talk about the experience, both positive and negative, working with ECW? <clears throat> I never had any negative, honestly. I was the, the, it, it, whenever we started getting to the point of, um, having money problems and stuff, it, it, I, I didn't see it. Uh, because it never affected me until I got the phone call. Then it affected me. <laughs> yeah. But once I got the phone call, that was it. 
you know, there was no more, you know, uh, I, I got the phone call to not go to the last few shows that were going to be in, uh, I think in Arkansas and a, in a couple of other places, but they, they called me and told me, not, don't worry about going. Uh, they're working out something else and they're going to get back with me. And then the very next week, of course, you know, I got the word, uh, of course I saw Paul, you know, on, uh, WWE and then, uh, got the phone call the next day after that. But like I said, it, I never, you know, didn't get paid. Uh, and when the company went, went shut, then that's when my paychecks quit coming, you know, but, uh, I but just, that's, but that's odd, right? Like, like, I'm so, I, 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 so I, just so I understand it right. So I get the timeline, right. You didn't know that ECW was done until you so saw after you saw Paul on TV with WWE. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's well, oh, oh, the last few months. What was that? What was that like the last few months? Because I know they lost the, after they lost the TNN deal. It was like all hands on deck, right? Yeah. The last few months, uh, the word was that Paul was uh, in New York and L.A. and you know because he wasn't at the shows uh, a lot of the time after that. He was out trying to push the sale of the show, you know, and I knew that he was out doing stuff in LA. Well, then come to find out he was doing, a, what was it? Roller jam or something? Roller ball. It was, a, he, he was doing a movie. Um, but, and I didn't know, you know, I knew that he was doing a movie, but I was co just going to work. You know, I was just going to work. They continued to book me. I continued to get a airline. I continued to get a paycheck. I just kept going to work. Now, Paul wasn't there on, on a few of these shows and you would hear things. But, you know, when, when you're in the wrestling business, the, that old, you know, saying goes, you know, believe nothing of what you hear and only half of what you see, you know, so it's wrestling. <laughs> so, but we heard that he was trying to get a deal with Fox and uh, I think uh, TN, uh, can't remember, I think it might have been TNT instead of TNN or something like that. But he was working on getting a deal. And he was working really hard, and that's all I knew. And then, uh, like I said, I got the phone call to not show up at the last few house shows. And then uh, the very next week when I saw him on WWE, uh, but then I started seeing, you know, like Sabu and Taz and other people on there too. So maybe, you know, it, it, nobody without anybody telling you, you know, it makes you, it made you wonder, oh, well, maybe we must be working something out with WWE, you know, I mean, everybody's there, you know, but then uh, I got a call from WCW and uh, with an offer. And so I kept trying to call Paul. I couldn't get a hold of Paul. Tommy Dreamer wound up getting it hooked up to where I talked to Paul. And then Paul simply said, uh, you want to go to work? And I was like, I do. And he was like, all right. He goes, you still have time left on your contract. If you sign over in every, you know, financial, you know, amount, sign it over free and clear. I'll give you a release. And then I'm, so I did. Uh, we did it like literally right there. Uh, I drove over to Kinko's and called him back and we did it all right there. And as soon as that happened, I sent mine into WCW and then WCW sent me an offer. And then I went to do the, uh, what was it? The last thunder for them. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I got to ask one question about ECW. Um, Obviously, they had a lot of success for being sort of like an underground company. I don't want to say underground company, but it was an alternative company to what was going on, and it drew so much traction. Um, can you talk about what it was like? Because there's always these historical stories that Paul would just set up in the middle of the dressing room and, you know, say, you're going to do this, and why don't we try and do this? What was your dealings like with Paul, and what was it like for you to be in this, I, I don't want to say like a cult following with the fan base, but you're, you, the way you market ECW is with their fan base. Yeah. Uh, those, those stories were true. Paul was a very... <laughs> Very inspirational uh, boss. Uh, he could could pump up a crowd, <laughs> especially the dressing room. Man, he. Uh, I, I I remember uh, we were in uh, L.A. and we. I don't know if you heard about the the fight that we had with. Uh, I think it was X P W. 
No, I never heard the story. Yeah, there was another company, Rod Rob Black or something. He, there was like a porn guy that owned another extreme wrestling company, Extreme Professional. I think it was XPW. And uh, they were actually using a few of our guys here and there, you know, and they were running some of our towns and they were from L.A. And we went to L.A. to do a pay-per-view and uh, we were uh, they, they, they got tickets for the front row. Big little deal started with Francine and uh, one of their girls, Lizzie Borden, I think. Uh, they got kicked out. And so they're all, you know, raising hell as they're leaving. And they get all out in the parking lot. And Paul, we're all standing in the back back there. You know, the show kind of came to a little bit of a halt, you know, but the match kept going. And all of us are standing in the back all together. And he just gives this speech about <laughs> This is our fucking turf, you know, and you don't think <laughs> this is ECW and you don't do that. We are the extreme and let's kick their ass. And everybody, without hesitation, without any questioning whether you were a fighter or not, you ran out that damn door. And we were having a parking lot, fist fighting, I mean, free for all. It was exciting. Uh, I, that's probably one of the best memories I'll keep with ECW just that one particular day. It was so amazing. It was just so amazing to have the whole dressing room just came flying out two double doors and we were in the parking lot. And we we're just beating the crap out of a, you know, an opposing uh, wrestling company in the parking lot. So cops got called, you know, everybody, they broke it up. We came back inside and then finished the show. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, <now. laughs> That's great. Jesus. I think that was ECW. Man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you mentioned WCW. What was it like being a part of the company sort of on its final days? Um, you weren't there for the chaos, which was the uh, NWO and all that stuff and the battling with Russo Bischoff. What was it like for the final days of WCW? Um, it, it, it was pretty hectic, I think. Uh, I, I wasn't there long. I was only there a total of about three weeks. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I signed with them. I got brought in a week later. I did a couple of dark matches, and then I got brought in the next week, and I did a thunder. Uh, then the following week, they called me and told me, like, you know, don't we're going to, you know, I know you're supposed to be in Panama City, but, you know, we're just going to set this one out. We'll be calling you next week. And I'm like, all right. So uh, they didn't call me. I, I watched what happened on TV and uh, I, nobody, just like ECW, nobody knew what was going on because even whenever I was there, you know, when I signed and got, you know, doing the dark matches, it was like business as usual. Nobody was, you know, talking about anything differently. You know, nobody was bringing anything up. Uh, nobody was whispering in corners or anything like that, you know. So, yeah, but then a uh, couple weeks, uh, at, well, I, I'd say almost a month later, I finally, and I was getting paid. Uh, they they kept sending me my paycheck. And, oh, so there's uh, no complaints there. <laughs> no, I, I mean, but I didn't get that phone call. Next thing you know, John Laurinaitis did call me, and he said that, uh, okay, here's the deal. Uh, I, I signed a pretty good deal. Jimmy Hart worked with me. Uh, a lot and uh, he worked with me on quite a few you know deals that I had over the years he worked helped me work that one out and I had I signed a, a really nice deal for myself you know that I was very happy with you know and uh, so he comes back and he, and he says uh, we have a new company you know we got so many wrestlers now that it's going to be a little bit we're going to have to weed everybody out that we're going to keep and blah 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 but Vince wants to keep you uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to renegotiate your contract and we want you to move to Cincinnati and uh, wrestle there until we call you. And I'm like, well, okay, well, here's the deal. Uh, at that time, I was like 35, 36 years old. I was like, okay, I'm 35 years old. I, I own my own house in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I've been wrestling for 15 <laughs> years. Uh and Kid Cash and w, you know ECW and you know I've traveled the world you know and um, I'm kind of well known a little bit. They're not like a Stone Cold or anything like that, but I, you know people know who I am and you can push me as a you know as a definitely a light heavyweight. Um, so 
I don't know if I really want to be moving. You know, I don't want to move to Cincinnati of all places, get in an apartment. So that means I would have to sell my house, yeah, you know, or, you know, get an apartment for a thousand dollars a month, you know, and then wait. And I was like, well, how long would I be there? And he was like, you know, this business, you could be there three weeks, three months or three years. And so I called Jimmy and uh, talked to him and Jimmy was like, just my opinion. Uh, I, I think you're better than that. And I think they'll want you later on. And I was the, okay. So I called back and, uh, you know, found out what they wanted to renegotiate my contract down to money wise. And it wasn't good at all. <laughs> I was like, holy crap. I was like, uh, that's a huge jump from what I signed for to what you're offering me now. And you want me to go to a developmental group and take the risk on getting hurt. You know, now I'm in my mid thirties, you know, I'm not going to be, you know, you got me in a, you know, a developmental group with a bunch of young guys, you know, and uh, yeah, it's going to put me at risk of getting hurt, you know, and uh, which, you know, when I did finally sign with WWE later on, you know, they had me in the uh, Atlanta area there and I did get hurt, you know, I broke my arm. <laughs> you know, yeah. but I went on ahead and did that just, to get, you know, to show them that I could do good business and get in, you know, but because I did turn them down the first time and they held it, you know, the John Lauren, I just held that against me there for a little bit, you know, uh, what John Lauren I, holds a grudge. I can never see that happening. I, I you know, I couldn't <laughs> believe it too. I mean, uh, you know, and later on when I, when I finally signed with him, I talked to him about it. I was like, you when I first met you, you really liked me a lot. And then, but after the WCW thing, you, you know, I, I hear, you know, other people saying, you know, that, you know, you think I do bad business and stuff. And he was like, you you turned down Vince McMahon. And I was like, well, it, you know, it wasn't, it was business. Like you do business, you know, you wouldn't sign a contract if it would, if it wasn't going to be, you know, suiting you and, you know, getting what you're wanting, at least something of what you want out of it. You know, I'm, I'm, you're a businessman. You've been in this business too long, you know, to not do that. And I'm not a mark. I'm not a young kid who's just impressed and wanting to be with the WC, WWE or WCW. You know, it was, it was beyond that. I'm a grown man. I have bills to pay. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I'm not a mark for this anymore. I, I quit being a mark after Wahoo broke my ankle. You know, I mean, the, this was about business and paying my bills and, you know, having a future and a retirement, you know, and, you know, well, getting yeah. that, you know. So, so, the, so, the, so what was dealing with John Laurinaitis, it turns into tele, you basically say it's telephone, telegram, tele wrestler. It's just, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's just, it's just the word gets around. Yeah. And he, I mean, after a while, he, he started liking me again. I, I think back, you know, whenever I did sign, re sign back with him again, you know. But after that little conversation, I think we understood each other a little bit better. I mean, you know, John, I mean, I wasn't in my 20s. I wasn't like that young kid trying to just get there. You know, I've already been there. I've done that. And, you know, just trying to keep my career going until I retire, you, you know, and and that's where I was at. I It's time to make that money. You know, look where I'm at now. I'm 52 years old. You know, I'm, I'm a couple of weeks away from going in to have a hip replacement, you know, <laughs> so yeah. – uh, hip replacement uh, later on next year. I got to have uh, my L4 and 5 fused together. You know, I mean, and that's 28 years of bouncing my body yeah, around. It's, it's, brain, 20 years, it's, it's 20 years of abuse of your body, yeah. you know. So I needed but, to get paid for it, you know. Um, well, for for you, you know, you said you know, had a good relationship with, with, you know, getting with WWE and, of course, your time with ECW. I, I can't not ask about ECW one night stand and, and when you were you were sort of like on the uh, you're with T TNA at that time but you came in for the ECW one night show what was it like for the was to see, was it, did you feel like you're in a time machine being at the Hammerstein ballroom like that yeah uh, actually I, I don't know how that worked out uh, I got permission to do that uh, I, I think Tommy Dreamer had a lot you know, to do with that. So, but uh, I, I did, I asked, and at first they said no, of course, and I was expecting them to say no. Um, but uh, then they came back and said, yeah, you know, just, just one time and one time only, be, you know, we work with, you know, 
hopefully make up some and uh, create a good relationship, you know, between you know, maybe a start of, of one anyway. And, uh, but yeah, it, uh, when I went there, it was cool. Uh, it was weird, you know, I'm under the TNA uh, contract, but I'm under a uh, WWE banner. <laughs> you know, I think it was in. one of the first times that, that really happened where you had a TNA performer going on a WWE production. Yeah, I think that's the first and only time, I believe, at the yeah. same time, you know, where I was contracted, you know, and uh, there yeah, that, might have been somebody else, I think. I'm not uh, really sure. they, actually, I know one other time they did a talent swap with Christian and Ric Flair. Uh, so that was, that was the only other time but you know what though you basically were the first one so you are like technically in the history books in that sense yeah, <laughs> yeah I've been there for something anyway right <laughs> <laughs> well you also had your hand in mixed martial arts and then gave MMA a shot what was that experience like for you stepping in the cage well here's the, here's something that uh, a lot of you guys don't even know I, I followed in the cage for, for years um, in between the wrestling and stuff like that. I mean, I just, the, the wrestling was, uh, had become more of a, a piece of, for money, you know what I'm saying? For, for a namesake and for stardom and, and things like that. You know, the MMA, when I was coming up in it, it wasn't the, what the UFC is now, you know, it was, you know, you didn't win the, you know, you didn't win the kind of money that you win now. You know, it, it's, it was a whole lot more lower key, you know. So I'd done some fights for, you know, like King of the Cage back in the, you know, the 90s and stuff like that. We did a lot of, uh, you know, Naga tournaments and Pan Am tournaments and, you know, those kind of things. And did a lot of, uh, like, uh, exhibitions. Did, did a quite a few exhibition MMA fights, you know, just because I was Kid Cash, the pro wrestler. And, you know, these uh, pro level, state pro level, you know, uh, shows would have, and they won like a special fight. And I would fight one of their guys, you know, pro wrestler versus MMA, you know, kind of thing. I did those kind of things for years, you know, but uh, whenever I had then finally kind of decided to retire from wrestling, uh, I wanted to just, you know, give it like a full shot, you know, because up until that time, I, I had never really trained an absolute full camp before, and, you know, since I was young, you know, whenever I was young, getting, you know, fighting in the Pan Ams and fighting for the Nagas and things like that, you would do a full camp. But when you become a pro wrestler and you're traveling around the world and you're wrestling five days a week, you know, you're training every week, but, uh, and every day, but it, the, the, the training is completely different. You know, it's, it's not as intense, not as in depth as it was before, you know? So i just put it all together and, uh, I had, uh, let's see one I did, we did three fights, uh, lost two and won one, a decision. And the last one I lost, uh, in about 39 seconds, but, uh, I, in, in one single blow, I tore my trap, my bicep, my oh. pec, and my rotor cuff. <laughs> oh man. So my entire right side, I tore this trap and the behind, it came down and I, I tore my uh, bicep up top, tore my pec over here, and then, of course, I tore my rotor cuff in the back on one upper cuff. Wow. Oh, my Lord. And, and then I just realized, you know, the, and the, the, the one I had lost before that was by decision. We went, uh, you know, the, all, all three rounds. It was just a three-round fight. Uh, the one before that I won, but I went three rounds, and it was, you know, it was a hard ball fight. And I, you know, won by decision. But the thing about it was my age. My age was catching up to me at this point. You know, I wasn't, you know, I was training hard, but I was training hard for a 40-year-old at the time. You know, and anybody knows much about mixed martial arts, after about 35, you know, your steam starts going down just a little bit, you know. And, things started happening. And then uh, with the last fight, I tore, I had a minor tear in my rotor cuff three weeks before the actual fight, but I did get clearance. I did get clearance because everything was feeling good and yeah. we had switched to a plan B. Uh, and on top of that, my fighters, my, my fight got changed. I two fight, two different fighters. Well, the first guy uh, broke his ankle in training. So then they, got me another guy. Uh, the other guy 
I guess just didn't want to fight no more. So <laughs> he got out Then they finally got me another guy that wound up being a purple belt in jujitsu, uh, six foot four and uh, with the longest arms and legs I've ever seen, you know? So the original guy that I was trained, I had trained for, you know, he was a wrestler and Sambo guy. So I had trained for, right at about nine, nine and a half weeks wow. for this particular guy. And then I got another guy that was a karate guy that wound up not fighting at all. And so then I had to switch gears real quick to another guy who was a jujitsu guy. So I had no time, really. I had about two weeks to get some jujitsu guys in there, you know, and uh, really work with some serious jujitsu with me. And uh, so – while I was doing the groundwork, I ignored my striking. So my shoulders weren't really, you know, up to par. So we got in there and uh, the kid is six, like I said, six foot four. I'm looking like way up at the guy. So plan C comes into effect. <laughs> when you see how tall the guy is, you know, you're like, Jesus Christ, this guy's like a mountain. You know, he's like so tall. How am I going to do? So, hey, plan C, let's get in, grab the guy, throw him down, and let's just grapple him and, you know, ground and pound. But remember, he's a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. So, uh, I was expecting the kid to kind of, you know, like feel me out. Uh, but when the bell rang, he actually came right across the fucking ring and was – throwing, you know, throwing them long arms and legs. And so I had to ignite it right then, right there and uh, got in real. And I went to throw a big uppercut when I did. Everything just started tearing. <laughs> Soda tore. Everything was torn. Wow. Uh, came, came down. Uh, arm just completely gave out on me. Uh, couldn't raise it. I got a good knee to the face. Got knocked down. And that's when I tore my pec because uh, – when my arm came down, he, he got me in the face with a good knee, and uh, I hit the ground. And when my back hit the mat, my pec tore. So when I got up, uh, my bicep was back here, and the uh, my trap was right here. So the referee automatically seen this and immediately stepped in and uh, called the fight. And uh, then I had to go get two surgeries. Oh, wow. <laughs> we, uh, yeah. Well, from from you doing that, and then you were able to see other wrestlers take a shot at MMA, like guys like Batista and CM Punk. You, you, so you like you, you feel what they were going through, and you understood. And like you said, after the age of thirty-five, it becomes difficult. CM Punk did it, at, I think, right around that age too. Were you surprised of the, of the criticism that he received for doing it? Well, the last fight I did, I was forty-six. Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I was forty. Yeah, I was forty-six. That was two thousand and sixteen. That was the last fight I did. Um, yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, even at 35, bro, I mean, the training is completely different. People would never understand it unless they actually, had, you know, where it was able to do it for themselves. I mean, it's you can't explain it. Uh, it's it's very intense. It's very uh, demanding. I mean, and it demands every minute of your time, your thought, your body. You just don't go into a fight, you know, training and then thinking you're just going to win. You got to, it's a chess game. It's a, it's like a chess game. You, you know, you, you got to put the pieces together. I mean, you got to watch film. You got to, it, it's a lot. Quick. And for those guys, you know, they, they, whether they win or lose, they should feel no shame. Period. I lost the last two fights that uh, I, I had, you know, of my career, and I'm not ashamed of it at all because every loss is a good thing. I mean, it, it's a win. It really is. Every loss is a win. Now, whether you go back and fight again, ever again, it's still a win because it got you to the realization of where you need to be in life. It got me to the realization <clears throat> I need to I need to step up. And I need to admit to myself that I don't have what I used to have. It is what it is. As bad as I hate to admit it, as bad as I hate to feel that way, it, it, it's nature. And uh, there, there's only one heavyweight champion in the world that has never lost and never will. And that's Father Time. Father Time is the only undefeated champion in the entire history of the universe. 
<laughs> you can't beat him. You cannot beat him. And uh made me realize that. So I actually won because now I know uh, that I, I don't need to do that to myself no more. <laughs> you know, I still train. I still train. Uh, I don't train six days a week anymore like I used to. I train martial arts three days a week, and I train boxing twice a week. And I don't really do any, uh, you know, amateur wrestling anymore, grappling or anything like that. But uh, my knees and back and hip are so bad, you know, it's kind of hard to get down on the ground like that anymore, you know. So, uh, but other than that, uh, I, I think those guys should be happy for what they did. CM Punk. You know what? <laughs> people can say what they want. I, I mean, because a lot of people gave him a hard time. You know, they really did. And uh, I look at him as probably one of the the, the smartest men in, in in actual sports. He did really well with himself. He, he started off as you know as just your average indie guy. Then he goes to Ring of Honor. Then he goes to you know to WWE, and uh, he did very well there for himself. He got into a conversation with Dana White. <laughs> and, a, and, and it snowballed. It, 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 <laughs> it got him two fights that yeah. paid him like a half a million dollars on each one. Yeah. You know, and probably more. I mean, I'm, I can't say for sure, but I believe it was like very, it was like serious, serious money. I mean, and whether he won or lost, it doesn't matter. That man got two paydays and he drew two houses. For uh, UFC that was sold out, yeah, he did because his name, you know. So he, he should be very. Uh, I'm sure he is. I mean, he probably didn't think twice about it. He's probably thinking, "Hey, man, you know, you're welcome for the for the house tonight, and uh, you know, thank you very much for that big paycheck you just gave me." You know, so well, he did, he's I, a smart, smart man. I remember after his second fight, he had to go to the hospital. And at the post uh, post press conference, Dana said, someone asked him about CM Punk. He says, did Punk do media yet? And that's the first thing that Dana White says. That means Punk is a sales guy trying to get everybody in here. Oh, yeah, he's fighting too. But did yeah. he do his? Did he do media yet? So that, to me, was something that, that stood out to me. I'm like, wow, all right. So Punk was in charge of selling tickets to, to get everybody in the front door. And, he did, though. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he did. Um, real quick, let's plug your social media. Let's, let's let everybody know where they can find you. Uh, right now, I'm just doing Instagram. Uh, I'm actually about to shut down my Facebook. Uh, I don't really get on there that much anymore. And, uh, you know, like helping big tech out as much as uh, everybody else. So I'm not into that. But, yeah, I'm just, just the older I get, the more I'm slow, you know, slowing down on that kind of thing. You know, but I, I'm going to my Instagram is still up. Uh, my Twitter is still up. So you can reach me on both of those and stuff. And uh, I still do. Uh, appearances uh still do uh training seminars i don't wrestle anymore but uh yeah so i take bookings for appearances autograph signings uh seminars and things of that too so that's what i do yeah well, we thank you so much for giving us some time, and we really uh, – I, I hope you had fun. I, I had enjoyed, enjoyed talking with you. I wish we had longer, but yeah. uh, hopefully we can have you on again sometime. Anytime, man. You let me know. All right. Hold on one second. Guys, we'll be, back, we'll be right back here on The Cut for Wrestling Podcast. All right. So that was Kid Cash talking with David Kid, Kid Cash, enjoying retirement, taking care of his body, and uh, I didn't know he was a mixed martial arts fighter until we had this interview it was pretty cool new thing here we're going to do on the cut is we like to take care of the wrestlers we want to let everybody know where they are so you can help contribute and do some different things um so right now let's talk about where they're going to be signing autographs over the next couple weeks all these signings brought to you by wrestlingfigs.com go over there for all your action figure needs get all the news on all the upcoming WWE and AEW and New Japan action figures they also have a little section that lets you know where wrestlers will be doing autograph signings we're going to do this week's wrestling signings so for example this week check it out between August 13th and August 15th you can meet Kurt Angle Miro Orange Cassidy and Mick Foley at the Steel City Con in at the Monroe Convention Center in Monroe Mon Monroeville Pennsylvania. For tickets, go to www.steelcity.com for more information. Okay. Also, this weekend, 
The Enforcer Arn Anderson on Saturday will be available between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. before the IWC event at Court Times Square Center in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania. For more tickets and more information, go to icwwrestling.com. Listen, we're all AEW fans. The AEW crew and others are going to be in Poughkeepsie, New York at the Westchester County Center. Check out Paul White, Cody Rhodes, Darby Allen, Sammy Guevara, Tay Conti, Matt Hardy, Eddie Kingston. Hey, Jerry the King Lawler is going to be there. Private Party, QT Marshall, and I heard the Rock and Roll Express are going to be there as well. All there at the Mid-Hudson Civic Center, Poughkeepsie, New York. I'm sorry, I said the West County, Westchester County Center. I apologize. It's the Mid-Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, New York, this upcoming Saturday. Also, meet Sammy Del Cielo, uh, Kalisto. We'll just call him Kalisto from 2 to 4 p.m. at the Wrestling Guys store in California. Check out the WrestlingGuysStore.com for more information. Rob Van Dam and Rhino. Rhino is on this show. We might have a trivia question for our contest from, from the Rhino episode, but he's going to be at the Heroes Hideout with Rob Van Dam out in Albany, New York. Check that out. And also, if you're a fan of the 1980s and 1990s like I am, the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase, will be at the New Jersey State Fair at Sussex County Fairgrounds in Augusta, New Jersey, Saturday night between 6 and 9 p.m. And then this upcoming Sunday, meet QT Marshall at Ticker B's Toys and Comic Store out in Allentown, New Jersey. He'll be there. Check out the number is on the screen for more information. Tony Atlas on on Sunday from 11 to 2 at Wrestling Universe out in Flushing, New York. And don't forget to check out, same thing, down in Six Flags Great Adventure, Jackson, New Jersey. The Olympic gold medals, Kurt Angle, Darby Allen, Tay Conti, Matt Hardy, Enzo Amari, Sergeant Slaughter, Jerry Lawler, Carlito, and Private Party all will be at Six Flags Great Adventure this upcoming Sunday from 1.30 to 4.30 p.m. Go to Great Adventure's website for all the details for this upcoming Sunday's event. All right, real quick, special thanks to Andrew Fumi, our producer who puts our show together, Jamie Rush, Matthew Sargent, Austin Eric, and Jonathan Mowry, the crew from the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. We really appreciate it. Backsportspage.com, check us out. Next week's episode is going to be a real good one. We have Rohit Raju coming back for his second interview with us. That's right, but this time we're going to go a little bit more in depth about the man who is Rohit Raju. That'll be on episode two of season two here on the Cut Pro Wrestling Podcast. For Randy Zelia and the rest of the crew, we'll see you next time here on The Cut.